Let's look at that context and work through this. Remember this wonderful miracle, man is walking. And instead of the people giving praise to God, they think that the praise goes to false gods, and they call them Zeus and who else? Hermes. Uh, and so when Paul and Barnabas realize what's going on because it's a different language, they tear their clothes and like, hold up. We're men just like you. Don't make us gods. And we were challenged with that because even in the church, God can anoint, he can do wonderful things. And I think what's hindering the spirit, a lot of times the leaders get the big head. Um, the people that are in charge get the big head. And the people lift them up and they become demi-gods. They become these little g-gods and people can't get to the real God. So Paul and Barnabas realized, yes, a wonderful miracle has been done or wrought through our hands. But it's about Yahweh. It's about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And notice as we got to that 18th verse, they took them back to Genesis, to the beginning, um, that they should understand, even though they don't have the basic um, scriptures that uh, the Jews had, they should understand by creation that those gods can't do anything for you. And look at this verse 18. Someone read. And with these sayings, they despaired and restrained the multitudes from sacrificing. So they make this, this statement, but the people are so excited thinking that these are Greek gods that they get it, but they kind of don't. And so the word that they gave them kind of slows this process down. Um, very powerful says the message had its desired results, but people reluctantly desisted from their intention of sacrifice, sacrificing to these servants of the Lord. They, they were reluctant. They wanted to sacrifice because this gave them happiness. This gave them joy to think that the gods that they had been serving finally showed back up, finally did something. But their gods didn't do anything. It was the real and true and living God that had delivered this man. Um, I put that question there. I want to kind of get us thinking about uh, people desire gods they can see. Why? People desire gods they can see. Why? It's easier to believe something that you can see, put your hands on. What else? A lot of people like God that can see. Yes, sir. All right, so they can prove people. And oftentimes we see that in our society. Our God, we can't see him per se um, as, you know, a physical person coming. He uses us. So what people do uh, when their faith is not in the true and living God, they try to make their cars God, they try to make their houses God, they make family God. You know what? You can make this building. You can make church God. You can make your denomination God. And I've seen that a lot. Your denomination becomes God, and God is put out of it. We say that he's a part of it, but we've made a God that we can feel and we can see and the sad thing, we have to be very careful, we all want a God, right? But we come to God through Jesus Christ. But it's so, so easy to get off kilter, and we begin to produce a God that we can see, and we don't go to the true living God that we can't see. Amen. You made the car. I remember, man, he was, he was a great man. Worship. We see that people are making things to worship. I think even more sickening that we look in the church sometimes leaders become worship that we talk about. Um, I see some people that are devoted, and I do, I really get honored to whom honor is due. But they spend so much time lifting up a man or a woman that they're not lifting up Jesus. You know, they spend more time running after somebody else and not enough time in prayer and seeking the Lord, which is so, so important. Notice these uh, Laodiceans, these, these people, um, they reluctantly don't sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. But a judgment must come after this. When you tell people they can't worship you, something happens. They even choose the true and living God, or they get upset. 
All right? It always happens. They, they, they either go to the real God or they get upset because you've taken away their pacifier. So if you take a pacifier out of a baby's mouth that wants to pacifier, what do they do? They cry. The easiest thing for Paul and Barnabas would have been just let them worship. Sit back, you know, get some pineapple, let them, let them do what they were going to do. That was the easiest route. Don't go against the flow. The whole flow was to worship them. Now they stop that worship. So that emotion is all pent up. It's going to come out one way or the other. Notice as the story continues on, verse 19. We go from one side to the other. They are worshiping Paul and Barnabas all morning. Well, they are. They're worshiping. They just didn't get to the sacrificial part. And so now the sacrifice, hey, don't worship us. And then the enemy brings in Jews. And as they bring in Jews, what happens? What did the Jews do? They persuaded and stirred up. They took that emotion and twist it to the other side. All of us have experienced that. You ever had a real good friend, but you fell out with your friend, and that friend that had your back, all of a sudden they came your worst enemy? Yeah, all of these things, all of these things we see so often that um, there's a song, and y'all probably should listen to it, but a thin line between love and hate. Y'all remember that? It's just, I love this song. Really, one of my favorite songs. I can't sing in church, but there's a thin line. You know what I'm talking about. There's a thin line between love and hate. They were, they were in love with Paul and Barnabas. This is the Greek gods that have come back. No, we're not. Jews come in and everything begins to change. Someone read that first paragraph, please. They succeeded in turning the Gentile populace against the missionaries. The same crowd that wanted to reverence them as gods now stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that they had killed him. This whole process, they wanted to get rid of, supposedly, the little G's that they had lifted up. They want to kill them, all because they were stirred up by the Jews. I mean, this is moments. They were gods. Now they want to kill. Be careful. When people lift you up, now I just say, man, I don't care whether it's on a job, whatever. Your elevation, don't get too comfortable. Because those same folk that push you up like this can have a knife to take the air out of you. <laughs> Really, God has to exhaust you. Don't let people do that, because when people, the, the same people that push you up, they'll take you down. We see this. Paul, because he was the chief one, they want to kill him first. And they drag him out. They stone him and drag him out of the city. Didn't kill him. It was probably easy for the Jews when they came to the destruction to say to Paul, because part of Paul, you know, part of him telling them that they were not gods, they had to tell them that. This whole process, you're, when you take away people's belief system, there's usually trouble. That's why it's tough, and, and that's why we're challenged as we go line up a line through the scriptures, because a lot of us have a belief system that's been built outside of the Bible. Really, a lot of things that we believe were not in the Bible. It's kind of been added on and structuralized, and we believe certain things that are just not there. If we would read the scriptures, and some of us even read the scriptures, and we kind of figure, well, it's got to be there. No, it's, it's really not. A lot of the stuff that we do, even in our churches, is not in the scriptures. I'm not saying that it's bad. A lot of it's not bad. It's tradition. That's great. But some of it can be dead when it takes our eyes off of grace. Jesus Christ has to be first. Notice we continue to do this thought product. Um, they think that um, Paul is dead. They're dragging him out. Kelly comments on this section. Someone read that first part, please. And why? That very refusal of homage which the listeners were ready to pay is most offensive to man and disposes him to believe the most odious representations of those he was about to worship. 
Um, Deacon Kelly brought this out. He uses big words, Kelly, but what he's saying here, now they're challenged with the mindset, we were worshiping Zeus and Hermes. We made these men Zeus and Hermes, but they're not Zeus and Hermes, and it challenges their mindset. And, and when you mess with people's paradigm again, you got trouble. It has to be filled by something. There's a, and, and, and any time you, you take a child's a Christmas away, you don't talk Santa Claus over and over, I'm going to mess somebody up, but you don't know, talk Santa Claus, it comes down the chimney, and then you, they find out it messes with a child. Some of you still, you, you still believe Santa Claus coming out. He don't, I'm telling you. He don't. I mean, I could have sworn I was, um, I was probably 13 or 14, maybe 12, 13 or 14, that I saw Santa Claus uh, on a, in a sled with, some, with his reindeer flying over the house. Really, I, was, I, can, I can tell. I was on my uncle's house and we were standing over there and I looked out the window and I, I, I saw Santa Claus. He come from North Pole. He was in there. He had a red suit on. And he had little reindeer without front and everything. Really, I jumped in the bed so quick. That's still in my mind. That is still in my mind. Now, I know. I know now. That is not true, but I have been told News 2 came on that night. And News 2 said Santa Claus was on the way. He was close. He was coming to our area. I amen now. I believe that. I believe that as a little child. I was that little. And I looked out the window and I swore I saw him. So you take that away from me. What can I believe? And I think a lot of people, that's where they are in our society. I see it so much. They, you, they, so much has been torn down. Religion has been attacked. The Bible has been attacked. God has been attacked. Jesus has been attacked. And so people go, what can I believe? And look what happens. People find stuff that they're willing to blow themselves up. Kill hundreds. Not even care. Do all kinds of loot things to their body. Uh, men with men, women against women, trying to find some kind of peace. What can I believe in? Look at this next part. Go ahead, Brother Jones. Men exalt themselves by human adoration, and to be fault of it soon turn to the hate, hatred and perhaps death of those who seek the honor of the only God. So it was here, instead of, instead of changing their minds like the Maltese, who were my murder. Murderer regarded Paul as a god at 26. They listened to Jewish calumny, so ordinarily despised, and stoned as a false prophet, him to whom they had been so lately wishing to sacrifice, leaving him dragged without the city of the dead man. See how quickly the pendulum goes to the other side. And we've got to make sure we know what we believe in. Because I'm telling you, if our faith is challenged and you don't, you're not truly saved, you can swing to those. I've seen it. I've seen people in the church go the furthest out of the church. I know I say it kind of both sides. You, that, man, they worship it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then they're challenging their life or someone gets upset with them. And the next thing you know, they're out of the church. They don't want to come. I mean, years away. Some of you got family members who are faithful in church. Their feelings got hurt. And all of a sudden, it's been years. And they won't even, they don't come to funerals. They're not Christmas, Easter, nothing. <laughs> Why? Because their belief system was in a person, a man, and not in the Christ. Look at this last part. Was Paul actually dead as a result of the stoning? If this is the incident referred to in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, he himself did not know. The best we can say is that his restoration was miraculous. I've uh, taught it from both ways, but to be stoned and to get up, and we're going to find out, go back to ministry so quick, it was a miracle hand of God. Yeah. I don't know how I threw a stone one time. I hit, I hit one stone. I just uh, love to throw stones. I wouldn't throw them at people, but I just throw them across there. It was an apartment place across from my house on Pine Street. I threw my best stone. But this little girl happened to be in the way of my best stone. You know, right here, it was just one stone. I got beaten over that thing. But I just, that was just one stone. Her eyes swole up. And my dad was like, you know, you could have put the girl's eye on it. I like, but can you imagine people picking up stones and just throwing at you over and over again? That was just one stone that messed up the little girl. She probably still got the scar above her eye. I cannot imagine multiple stones. 
but God raised them up. Second mm -hmm. Corinthians twelve two. Someone read, please. I know a man in Christ who fourteen years ago, brother in the body, I did not know, or whether out of the body, I did not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third day. What I love so much about the scriptures, you can compare scriptures with other scriptures. We read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Paul gives bits and pieces of his life. But Acts is the total story of Paul in the first missionary journey, second missionary journey, and third missionary journey. So now we can compare these scriptures and we can link these. Maybe Paul was literally talking about this time when he was stoned. He said, I don't know I, whether I was in the body or out of the body. Only God knows. This could have been the time that literally he was caught up to the third heavens. So many things could have happened at this point. But we do know it was a miracle hand of God that raised them up. Look at this verse 20, which solidifies that. Someone read, please. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went to the city. And the next day he departed from us to the priest. Verse 21. And the next day he departed from us to the priest. So he's laying outside of the city. And when they dragged him out, <laughs> literally, I mean, this was capital punishment for them. He's dead. And I, I really believe he was dead. I don't think they would have stopped until... Uh, Paul stopped moving, and they, you know, someone like, he's still breathing, throw another stone. I, I believe he was there. They dragged his limp body out, and then what happens? What, 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 what do we see in this scripture? Yeah, we, we seem to indicate here the disciples get there, they may pray, some anointing, some power is there, but as they gather around him, he did what? He rose up. Remember, there are always consequences. We see Paul being used mightily in so many miracles up to this point, man getting up and walking, but at this point he's down, God gives him a miracle. He raises him up and, and what does he do? He goes into the city. I'm going home to get some rest. I believe it. I'm like, this is definitely a sign from God that I am out of the will of God, but being stoned does not stop the ministry. That's just amazing to me. I'm telling you, I'm going home and wipe my wounds, and they're like, you know, I need a sabbatical at least a few weeks or so. Not Paul. I know my calling. God raised me up. Therefore, I'm not finished. And I think all of us need to keep that in mind. No matter what we go through, if you're still here, you still got a calling on your life. You still have to keep pressing. Look at this next part. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby, 21. Someone read. And when they had All right, now we're going to go through, we're going to look at some of the missionary stops and what they actually symbolize. Go ahead and read that first paragraph, please. Considerations of personal safety were not uppermost in the mind of the missionaries. This is seen in the fact that when they had preached the gospel at Derby, they returned to Lystra, the scene of Paul's stoning. This illustrates what has been called the power of combat and quick recovery. Isn't that wonderful? I told you, that's why I wasn't called to be an apostle. That time. I just went off. I was like, let's go beyond. <laughs> Get the kids. We moving. <laughs> this, this. Mm -mm. I ain't called for this. But notice, days recovery, they go right back. That was the miracle hand of God. I wish they had given us more details if Paul had bruises, if he was swollen, and everything. But we, we get nothing of that. All we know is that they got around him, he rose, and he's back on the ministry of journey. That's all we know at this point. We know it's the power of God. Go ahead to that next paragraph, please. Although Timothy is not mentioned here, he may have been saved at this time through the preaching of Paul. When the apostle visited Lystra, Timothy was already a disciple and was highly regarded by the brethren. However, the fact that Paul later spoke of him as his true child in the faith does not necessarily mean that Paul had won him to Christ. He may have been a true child by following the example of Paul's life and service. So when these, these, these steps here in this first missionary journey, it's most likely that this is when Timothy is met up with. So remember, God doesn't waste time. Wherever you are in your life, God is connecting you with someone. And oftentimes we find ourselves in dark places, but it's not dark for God. God knows where you're going. Uh, even, I, I even say this, even when we get out of the will of God, God is still in control. 
He's not surprised. He's not like, whoops, I didn't know they were going that way. No, God is God, and they're always contingent plans, and I'm so glad. I want to be in the perfect will of God, but it's so good to know that God will always be God no matter where I am. And this is the process. We pick up Timothy, so God is working in this. Look at this next paragraph. Go ahead, Sister Al. When their work at Lystra was completed, the missionaries revisited Iconium and Poseidon, Antioch where churches had already been established. Their purpose at this time was what we call follow-up work. They were never satisfied merely to preach the gospel and see souls won for the Savior. For them, this was only the beginning. They then sought to build up the believers in their most holy faith, especially by teaching them the truth of the church and its importance in God's program. Now, what do you get out of that? Anybody? More than the all right? It's, it's more than just, a lot of times we just want to share the gospel, but what's the next part of that? Discipleship. Ms. Michael Stern, I've been on a lot of missionary journeys, and uh, Cindy can agree. Sometimes we go, we share the gospel, but my heart always goes out to the follow-up part. What do you do? You, you share the gospel and just leave them there? Well, baby, we don't do that with babies. Put a bottle in their mouth and just walk away. No, they have to be nurtured. And I think that's where we miss it in the church a lot of times. We are so big on people coming up on Sunday, getting saved. And I want them to get saved, but that's not the only time they get saved. But I also know people need to get fed. They need to get the understanding. And that's where the discipleship comes from. Notice that last part. For them, it was not only the beginning. It was not only the beginning. They then sought to build up the believers in their most holy faith. That's why we have so many Bible studies. Uh, and God has done this, really. Uh, we started out with Wednesday night and Monday night Bible studies. Those grew, and then Tuesday night, or Tuesday afternoon, that noonday came. And it's all about um, us growing together, getting the Word of God. I've gone through the Bible so many times, but guess what? Every time I go, I grow. I grow more. I get more understanding. I make more links. And then that causes us all to become more mature saints. Uh, it's a wonderful thing as we walk through our day, our stresses of life, when the Word of God comes up into our spirit. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, we can be going through, and you actually hear that still, small voice, maybe something from Sunday or Bible study that encourages you, and you know God is real. Because all you got to do is think back in the part of your life when you didn't think about Scripture. Oh, you didn't think about it. You, you thought about what Daddy said, get him. <laughs> That's what you thought. It's stuff you thought outside of the Bible. But now, as you study and you grow, it's more about what God is telling us to do. Um, go ahead to that next part, too. Ehrman points out. A proper missionary program has had at its aim the establishing on the field of self-governing, self-sustaining, self-propagating churches. This was ever the purpose and the practice of Paul. Um, this is key. When a church is just depending on one person, several people, you got issues. Yeah. If your joy is just coming from me, you got a problem. Because yeah. I ain't, I can't, I can't be right. Don't be calling me all the time to try to get joy. I, I love you. I'm gonna try to be there and everything, but I'm not your guy. Because you may call me sometimes at 1 a.m. or something. I, I may miss the call. And I did for several years. I'm um, starting out Ebenezer. Bianca, no, I kept my phone 24 hours, you know, ready for that. I was like, I gotta, I gotta get a do not disturb something. I mean, if God, you're gonna have to wake me up if this is a very important call because I realize I can't be God to, to people. I can't. I wanna be there when I can be there, but I can't be God. And so uh, if I set myself up God, I'm disabling the saints. So we all need to learn together, and our joy needs to come from knowing who God is and His Word. Because we can't be around each other 24 7, but God can be there. And we can have his word within our hearts. And that's how we grow. That's how a church becomes strong. But I see so often churches look strong. But all the enemy does, it takes out one block and everything disintegrates. Right? Have you seen that? Like, what happened? The word of God has to be the center. That's what keeps us. It protects us all. That's how we grow. Yes, ma'am.
Connect with God for yourself. Same thing. It's, it's okay. Call your doctor when you need a doctor. But at least call on Jesus first. <laughs> right? Some people call the doctor first, then Jesus. No. Call Jesus first. Then you can make those next steps. Very important. Was there another hand up? Notice as we continue on with this thought. Uh, very challenging. The church is growing. It's being strengthened. And that's our, our next point. Someone read verse 22. I don't like this scripture. Oh, I'm just being honest. You may like it, but it, it lets us know something. You will go through. Somehow, some way. It doesn't mean it has to be sickness per se, but we all go through some kind of emotional distress as we see this. We must, through many tribulations, enter what? It is what it is. Look at that first part. Go ahead and read, please. The exact nature of their follow-up work was strengthening the souls of the disciples and establishing the Christians in faith by instructing them from the Word of God. And you have to circle that. Circle that mentally. Whatever you need to do, strengthen them in what? The souls. The souls. Strengthening their souls in the Word of God. That soul, that emotional part, that soul that connects with God, that whole, our spirit, soul, mind, all of those things, our soul is that, that centerpiece, strengthening it. And I think so many people are so weak when it comes to connecting to the scriptures. It's amazing. You can sit through the, the church, and when you grew up in church, but never got the word. And, and I'm, I'm not putting it down, but never really got... Man, the word, and it's, it's always exciting to me as we go line up a line and we go through a scripture and people go, wow, wow, I got it. We talk uh, in our, our Tuesday, noonday, about 4,000 being fed into 5,000 with the multiplication of fish. And some people got excited because they thought it was just 5,000. But Jesus did that at least two times. He fed the 4,000 with fish and bread, and he also did the 5,000. They're like, wow. We've been reading the scriptures all the time, but when we go through it together, we're like, what a mighty God we serve. Our souls are being strengthened. They're being exhorted. Uh, as they're going, their instruction is coming that you've got to be strengthened to continue in the race. And that's why many are falling, because they're not being strengthened in the word. Go ahead and read that next paragraph, please. translation. Sharing with the people around all that we know. It's sad to say in, in this day and time, a lot of people know stuff, but they won't share it with the people. Why? Because as you give knowledge, that gives strength to the people. So you can be like the Catholics, some of the Catholics, they, they took away um, the right for people to read the word for themselves. And so only had the priests that would read it to us. So that put the power and control in the hands of those that were in authority. If you can limit people from reading for themselves, man, you got the whole control. But we see over the years things have opened up, and that was some of our Protestants came out of that because they wanted to be able to understand Martin Luther and the edicts that were put down. They wanted to give people the right to understand the word for themselves. <laughs> via the Holy Spirit. And that's what we have, but a lot of times people won't read anymore. It's amazing how I go to churches and Bibles are there. Nobody uses the Bible. You got Bibles on your phone. Nobody uses those anymore. I, I remember growing up, um, wonderful preachers. I came from a great, wonderful line of preachers, proclaimers, but oftentimes when it came time for the Word, um, the preacher would read the, the Scripture and close the Bible. 
And, and that taught other people, close your Bible. You, you don't need it anymore. And, and wouldn't really talk about it. It would be more of a topical subject and all of these thought patterns. But we need the feeding of the Word. We need that systematic Word because when we just focus in on that one topic, we can miss out on a whole bunch of people. How many times have we gone through the Scriptures line upon line, precept upon precept, and it was the exact Word you needed? It blossomed out from different areas simply because God was able to take his total context of the scriptures and minister to us all. That's what God wants us to do. He can speak from every word within his scripture. That is an amazing thing. And we all can get exactly what we need, that growing in the maturity of Jesus Christ. Look at that second part. Go ahead and read, please. at that time persecution was going. People, this was new to this area. But the first step is getting to the kingdom is what? That last part of it. The new birth. You've got to be born again. you got to be born again. I think a lot of people think they're on the way to kingdom, but they haven't been born again. They're pretending they, they look like they got it, but they haven't been changed from the inside out. That's what keeps you. Persecutions and tribulations do not have any saving value. However, those who enter the kingdom of God by faith at the present time are promised that the pathway to future glory is what? Filled with tribulations. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be... What are some type of tribulations that we experience? Health issues, sickness, losing family members, jobs. What type of persecution? Religious. Religious, being a Christian. What else? Tribulation. Just, just living. Sometimes I thought, you ever wanted to do something that the scripture said you can't do? Y'all, yep. y'all need to repent. Y'all need to get it all. <laughs> y'all do. Y'all need to piss me off. Some, some of my greatest tribulations persecuted because I want to do some stuff, and I read, I read it in the scriptures. The Lord spoke to my heart. I'm not supposed to do that. So I got to make a decision. Right? And sometimes those are the hardest struggles. You know what's the right way, but the flesh is like. Those are, those are, those are, those are tribulations that we go through. And as you grow in the Lord, they're going to be more. It can be a simple thing of prayer. You know you're supposed to be praying, but sometimes you just don't feel like praying. There's other stuff. You, you got your favorite TV program on, Scandal on, all this other stuff on. You go, you don't have time. I don't look at that, but actually, yeah. but uh, <laughs> really, there's so much temptations out there. It is a struggle. You haven't been looking at your favorite program. And then the Lord want to talk to you? Oh, yeah. I'm I'm serious. And those are struggles within our lives. We all have them. Emotional issues. Mental issues. Tribulations. We all. Loneliness. We talked about depression on, on Sunday. We all have these things. We're going to go through. But if, if Christ had to suffer... What makes us any better? We got the hope and know that he made it through, and that's why we can make it through also. Look at this next verse. Look at all the hands. 23. Someone read, please. All right. So they're strengthening them, um, edifying souls, the word of God that they have. Most of that is from the Pentateuch. Um, those 
first five books of the Bible that they're giving it. They're getting new revelation from the Holy Spirit. And they set up uh, this, this little E word that's called what? What does the scripture say? What's the E word? Leadership, you call them what? Elders. Elders. All right. The basic definition of elders is older people. Let's not do too spiritual about it. <laughs> you're an elder, or you're supposed to be an older person. Now, I know denominations have set up and all that about the elders, but notice it's not capitalized. It's elders. It was the older people that had matured in the faith. You can have young people that have matured in the faith, but most of the time it's going to be older people that have matured in the faith. So notice this. We really want to look at this doctrinal issue here. Uh, they set up in every church. They had prayed and fasting, so they were led of the Spirit with this. At this time, the missionaries also appointed elders in every church. In this connection, several observations should be made. Very important. Number one, someone read, please. Well, this is key. When you look at the scriptures, uh, these are interchangeable. <coughs> A lot of times I'll call our deacons elders here or our leaders here elders that are matured in faith because when I read the scripture, they are interchangeable. Um, I think our denominations sometimes have made these so stringent, they've actually missed out on what the scriptures are saying. Um, just simply, these are the people that had matured in the faith and they were able to lead others. It wasn't just one person, but it was a multiplicity of leaders that had grown in the Lord. And we need that in our churches. They are spoken of as also bishops and overseers. Look at number two. Someone read, please. time on it, and, and God would raise up those who were maturing in the faith. And everyone would know that. We're in, we're in a day and time. It's crazy. Um, a lot of times people are put in leadership um, positions, and they're not even respected other people. I got a call in my life, da 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 and all of a sudden we're supposed to just push you out there, and then the people are just supposed to respect you. <laughs> no, and we, we see that. I mean, you're like, I don't know who you are. Why am I going to follow you when you haven't even been around? You haven't even shown yourself faithful. So notice within the church, the people were there, and it took some time that they could look around, and the Holy Spirit can groom and raise up those who would be the leaders, who would be the elders. And that is the correct way. You lay hands quickly on nobody. You take your time. I know some people are crazy. <laughs> really? You really? Really, I would, I would say, excuse me, preacher, I'd say probably 80% probably of preachers are crazy. You know, you just, they don't really need to be in leadership. But because of their mindset and pushing through certain things, people just go, whatever. And you see the manifestation. They haven't improved. Uh, we're going to find out some things. If you want to be a leader within the church, you're supposed to be able to rule your own household. That's why I said 80%. percent <laughs> you all do some hallelujahs in that. I mean, really, really. And so all these processes we're missing out, and that's why it took some time, Holy Spirit to groom, and the people would respect. Deacon Lenny, how long have you been here? 49 years. 49 years. And then all, all those that are part of Ebony's that have been here, no, as he's our chairman of Deacon Ministry, I have no part time, no hard time respecting him because he's put so much time. He's been so faithful. I remember coming here 16 years ago. Man, he was just running. I mean, <laughs> here early, open the door, just there. No, because he put his time in that whole process, and there was some respect out of that. And even now, he just hit 80. Still running. I think I got him now, but I mean, he's so down, he's but still, just still 
faithful on it. And we got other leaders. I'm just, I'm just picking on him at this point. That are just faithful and showing themselves to this local body. And you know what? God has raised up our leaders, our elders. And this is what it was talking about. Not, not some kind of super spiritual office. Just faithful people who love the Lord that people can respect. And follow after their faith pattern in love. Look at his family. His wife, don't she look happy? Yes. <laughs> well, I've been by the house. The house is clean. <laughs> Dog would seem like he was happy. Everything was just... <laughs> All right, let me, let me move on. Uh, so we'll read when we have number three. There was nothing that was put down in black and white at this point. But the apostles did know about what leadership quality should be. How did they know that? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and what else? They, they had experienced it themselves. They had experienced themselves via who? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right? Many of them were connected with Christ. That's why they were apostles, those early apostles. And we see Paul said, I was one that was born out of season, but he was connected with that, and they had learned leadership. Those qualities were there, so they knew how to look out for men. And it is specific in here. They look after men because they were still focused on the hierarchy of the family, the leadership. Not that they didn't have women that worked in that, but they knew they wanted everything to mirror Christ. And we see this, and it'll be proven. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you just got happy. All right. <laughs> Serena. That's the idea of Jesus came along. There he came. And what did he do? He reached out to those men and taught them. You got to reach out, reach and teach. Amen. And from then on, it just went like that. You know, they knew exactly what they had to do. And he finds good leaders. Except for one, you know, he turned, you know. You're right. But still, he was selected as a leader. Reach and teach. And I think that's what we're missing. I think a lot of times it becomes all about specific people, not about God, as we said before. And people can read through that. They're like, why should I turn it out to that? Because this is going to be about one person or something else that's not of God. But when people can get fed the word of God, that's the growth. I've been in service. I'm like, why did I show up here? I'm just wasting my time. You know, I do. I be, I be playing stuff. <laughs> anyway, I do. You just sit there and you're like, why are you even here? And so we want to make sure that we're getting the word of God, that it's worth our time. And this is what they do, these elders growing together. That number four, we do have the qualification of elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. We're just going to go through those quickly because we actually dealt with those earlier as we went through the book of Acts. Therefore, each local assembly should be able to recognize those men in it who meet God's requirements as what? Under shepherds of the sheep. Okay, simply that. You always have leaders in there, that growing process we need to recognize. My concern is we're not reading the scriptures, we don't want to recognize Nobody wants to call it. Everybody's upset. Well, if God called them, who am I to say that they're not called? Because the scriptures already told us what they're supposed to look like. We can make so many bad decisions. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. Someone read 1 through 7, please. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires a position of bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, a good behavior. Able to teach. Not the divine, not violent, not greedy for the money, but gentle, not false, nor punished. Let's stop right there. 80% gone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, are we real? Think about it. I mean, just be real. You don't have to be a rocket scientist at this point. These are the qualifications now. You can argue with me that things have changed in our day and time, but if we go with the scriptures, these are very clear. Very clear. Go ahead and read the rest, please. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, he does not rule over the flock. For he is the head of the Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the 
I ain't make this up. <laughs> really, this is this is straight to the point. Uh, another big thing we talked about the house not being a rule is on house. We do. I'm um, just amazed you go for a job, a serious any serious job, they want background checks. And if you're gonna get any kind of clearance, I was in the military, they want to know everything. What you did, who you been with, all of those things, you got any diseases and blood tests and everything. But then we come to the house of the Lord, we just expect people to just be raised up. Don't really look into it. I, I, we were talking to the Dickens the other night. Uh, when I came to Ebenezer, they did a back in Charles England, did a background check on me. I uh, created rating and all this stuff. I'm telling you, it's, which is good. Which is good. Just that, that's, that needs to be done. But a lot of times, our levels uh, in the church, we just, we just kind of just let it go. And if we don't hear the voice of the Lord, we can see the repercussions of that. Look at the next part. Not a novice. What does the novice mean? Elders, elders, the office of elders is novice. That's one of the offices we can do. Just you know, not that God can use. I came here, I was 28, you know, I was a novice in a sense, but the deacons, being led of the Lord, they looked at my background. So my dad was a pastor, my granddaddy was a pastor, been in the church. So they gave me a little bit more maturity, been in the military. Hey, kids, kids are making me grow up real good. <laughs> I mean, all, all of these things were taken in there, but over the years, we've grown. I've grown. Grown, matriculated. Um, Deacon Lenny encouraged me one time. I got mad. I was mad. One of those meetings, and I, I said, Did you know? I, I mean, I cried. I just, I was, oh. I was just, it just some, some things, and I did. I just cried, and when I get upset, and I can't do what I want to do, with just, I got to let the emotion go cry. And I was expecting Dick Lenny to come and embrace me. Call me. Oh, why are you crying? Hurt, man. Just do your job. Just do your job. I thought that was so insensitive. <laughs> you gotta have a good wife. A good wife will tell you. Just do your job. <laughs> it is true. It's true. You grow and you become mature and you understand. Just do what God has called you to do. Sometimes we get outside our calling. We want to do everything else, but do your calling. Do you? Don't worry about anything else. A novice. Less. What happens when you're a novice? You're not mature. What? 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 What do you do? <laughs> Have you seen that? Leaders? I mean, it doesn't have to be bishops or whatever. Just leaders. It's fucked up. They were nobody. They were ushered at the back door and they got a little, and all of a sudden, uh, they start talking in King James Version. <laughs> 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 you say, amen. You know they do. They do. It's just the whole shame. They're just puffed up and don't know anything. Yes, sir. I was going to say that um, also, I've seen situations where um, where people say they're called to preach, and basically they have started off with a testimony. When I say a testimony, sure God saved you and wants you to tell it, but then in terms of he wants to elevate you to, to a role of, as, a, as, a, as a leader or pastor, you're not ready for that. So I, I've seen people give these grand testimonies. Yes, God brought you out and did, you know, and they, 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 they use that testimony as to say, you know what, I'm called to preach. I'm called to, to lead people. And you're not ready. Just a note. Just a note. You're right. Yeah. So, David, you have your hand up? No. Was there some other hands? Look at this last part of the scripture, very pro profound. In trying to find these elders in leadership, the good testimony among those who are where? Outside. Yeah, I, we, we need to get in people's business. You don't need to know my business. Yes, we do. We, you going to be a leader. We, we, we do. What do your coworkers think about you? Are oh, they show up late? They steal pens? <laughs> Not defendable? Why are you going to be a leader in the house? Of the so we're going to have a resignation on Sunday. Dude. <laughs> this whole process among those who are outside, let's be following reproach and the snare of the devil. We see that over and over again. The devil wants to take you down. Very powerful. 
look at this next part. So we've got um, the elders, that whole process, or the, that bishop, we actually did with that bishop section. The elders are the whole generalization of it. We have different parts of it. We've got the bishop, and also with that, we've got the deacons. Um, someone start reading verse 8, please. Deacons. We, we, we call them elders interchangeably. We got deacons. Deacons is, uh, that's a male in um, um, the Greek when you look at it. That's a male form. We have our deaconess, which you don't really see deaconess unless you interpret that as a wife. Deacons, we see here at this point, a statement is made, not double tongue. What does that mean? <laughs> tell you one thing, but they go over and tell somebody else another thing. Kind of like a politician. Yeah, two faced whatever you want. They, they should be double tongued. Um, and then we see that again, very important the wine. I'm not even dealing with the wine today because I know we ain't got no problem with that. Um, but greedy for money. <laughs> greedy for money. I see that so often. Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't even want to get into detail, but you're right, you think. I mean, you think I told the 8% going, it's going up, right? That 9% is all we got is 10%. It's really called. We do. The bishop, because I didn't want to deal with it a whole bunch, but what does wine do? The more you drink. Yeah, it, it, it impairs your judgment. Your judgment has an issue. Alright? Very important. And this is not just one. I think this can be interpreted to um, any kind of drugs in our life. And some of you are on um, certain medication. On, your, on the bottle it says, you, you take this medication, don't drive. Right? Don't, don't mess with any machine or anything. But yeah, you take it in the church, and you expect to be a leader. But then the bottle said, don't drive, don't do heavy machinery, and we make decisions sometimes, and we're under the inspiration of the drugs, and we hurt people. Because we're not being led of the spirit, we, we, we are in that dreamy state, and this whole process, we see the bishop, none, and then we see deacons, y'all have a book. Right. Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> yeah, for they often in first. Take a little bit for your stomach. Um, God, it's here. Somebody read, please. The quote is the mystery of faith with a computer conscience. But let these also be first tested. Then let the servant be found blameless. Yeah, they, they got to know what they believe in. <laughs> Pure conscience. And we see that, that testing part means time. All right, a process of time. And then they can get a lot of times people don't have time, and people get upset about that. Well, I'm, I can be. I, I've always found out when people say, "Hey, I need to be it now. I've been called now. You ain't ready." <laughs> that, that's usually a telltale sign. You're getting ahead. It's all about God's timing. So look at this again. Test it. Then let them serve. Very important. Serve. Servant as deacons. Being found what? Blameless. It doesn't say that they're perfect. But it does say, like, when you look at their life, you're like, okay, they are a Christian. They love the Lord. Not perfect, but they are striving to follow after God. Um, someone read 11 and 12, please. Likewise, Likewise their wives must be reverent and not swindlers, not faithful in all things. That they could speak the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own household. Well. Wow. But see, this whole process again, very important. That first part, uh, they must be what? Likewise, their wives must be. What's reverent mean? Respectful, reading unto God. Man, we, the number's going down, right? <laughs> really, some people say, I've heard this. Just look at me. Don't be looking at my wife. 
I'm, I'm called. My wife, she's doing what she's doing. Your, your wife affects you. You have a bad day with your wife, you have a bad day with us. Amen. 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 I do. I try to get it right with Bianca, especially on Sunday. <laughs> boy, I come to church. The boy got to be right with my wife. I'm telling you, because it affects. It affects yeah. one Sunday. Long, long, long. <laughs> <laughs> we got to fight. Usually, when we fall out, it's gonna be right before church or around church. So that's when the devil comes in. But then I was up. I was upset with. Her. But before I preached, I had to look at. I said, Lord, forgive me. And I kind of looked at her and I winked at her. Roll her <laughs> 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 You gotta get it right, it does. It affects everything. It affects everything. So you gotta be white, reverent, not slanders. If you're white and you wanna be in leadership meeting and she can't hold her tongue, she a backbiter. I'm serious. As I get older, I want to be able to help the dean and say, you got to control your wife before you can come with me. Well, we lost him. Temporal, <laughs> 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 faithful with all things. Look at this. Husband and one wife ruling their children again. With what? Own houses. You can't control your own house. Why are you going to try to control somebody else's house? That's just simple logic. Look at this next verse, 13, so we'll read. But those who have served well as the deacon of pain for themselves, a good standing and a great boldness in faith which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Serve well. There's reward in that. Amen. So look at Paul and Mark. He says, we've been going through this, going to different cities, establishing elders, bishops, leaders, deacons within the church that fit the qualifications that we have an understanding of. We're out of time for tonight, but when we come back, I want you to study ahead. Uh, we're going to go through Titus uh, 1, 5 through 9. We're going to look at the general um, settings, uh, qualifications for leaders, very important. I want you to focus in on it. And you got to ask yourself, as you look at today's church, how many leaders have failed in these qualifications? Right? And we're not, I'm not even really getting deep. I was just kind of generally sketching over what when we examine, man, our churches, so many of them have become dysfunctional because we don't have leaders who are qualified. Amen? We need to pray. Come on to your feet. Let's close out. Please study here. Please.